Good morning, everyone, and thanks for taking part in this inaugural Police Resilience Symposium. On behalf of all the men and women of the New York City Police Department, I want to thank Columbia University Irving Medical Center and Dr. Jeff Lieberman for helping us approach the crisis of police suicide from a fresh angle. Suicide by members of law enforcement is not new, but the way we talk about it, the way we understand its causes and consequences, and the way we work to prevent it is changing. Connecting credible research experts and resilience practitioners with the police will benefit our organization as a whole and critically our individual members. In spite of a wide array of personal and professional challenges, police officers across the nation and the world put on their uniforms each day and perform incredible acts in the name of keeping people safe. Without a doubt, societal pressures and the unique aspects of the coronavirus pandemic have made this an extraordinarily difficult time to be a public servant. I cannot imagine a more important moment in history for us to join with our partners to support our colleagues and to share positive mental health practices that enable us to continue our vital work and not just during Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, every day. Each and every one of our police officers must always know that no matter what they're going through at home or at work, they are never alone and they will get through it with our help. This symposium, this important conversation, will enhance our current efforts at reducing police suicide, increase collaboration between researchers and practitioners, and identify resources for officers in personal crisis to get necessary support. We're here to listen and learn from each other, to share ideas, and to work together to find meaningful solutions. Again, I want to thank all our participants for what you do every day. The work you do in your communities saves lives. And the work you do here will save lives too. Please know that the NYPD thanks you, our cops thank you, and so do all of their friends and loved ones. I know you'll get a lot out of this seminar. Thanks again for being here and stay safe. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really grateful for the opportunity for Columbia Psychiatry to partner with the New York City Police Department and uh, put on this symposium on resilience. Uh, it uh, couldn't be a more timely and important topic. Uh, however, uh, I'm going to guess that when you went into law enforcement, uh, you didn't expect that someday you'd be attending a symposium on mental hygiene and resilience. Uh, I have to say I feel similarly in the sense that when I went to medical school, I didn't see myself taking courses in all kinds of different things like sexual harassment or implicit bias and so forth. But I did, and here we are. Um, and while it may be unexpected, it's not entirely surprising because it's really a sign of the times that we live in and we live in different times, modern times, changing times. <clears throat> when the COVID pandemic hit in March, we quickly found out that we had another group of uh, people to care for besides our patients. Just to give you a sense of the rapidity of this uh, crisis, uh, on last week in February, I went to Boston for a conference. On March 2nd, the first COVID patient in New York uh, was admitted to the hospital. This was the lawyer from Westchester who had been traveling abroad. On March 15th, there was 200 patients in the hospital with COVID. On April 15th, there was 2,000 patients in the hospital with COVID. Um, there was like being in a war zone in terms of the massive volume of people who were sick, many of whom were in life-threatening situations. And what we found out was, in addition to taking care of the psychiatric patients who were coming in despite the fact that um, the COVID pandemic was the uh, main condition that was consuming uh, medical resources. Um, we found that the medical staff was really straining to meet the challenge. They met it, but with great cost to themselves emotionally. The emergency rooms, the ICU, the medical units. And so we quickly mobilized and created what we called a COPE Columbia initiative, which was having our faculty and staff deployed to provide not treatment, but professional support and stress management on a, a daily basis, and in some cases 24 seven for the uh, doctors, nurses, uh, technicians, staff who were manning the ICUs, the emergency rooms, the medical step-down units. Now, 
people in the healthcare business, doctors in particular, are tough. You know, you go through medical school, you're sleep deprived, you have to manage life threatening situations, you see a lot of death. Um, but no matter how strong somebody thinks they are, everyone has their breaking point. We tragically learned this when one of our best and brightest, Dr. Lorena Breen, who was the associate director of the Department of Emergency Medicine and had been at Columbia for 15 years, committed suicide. Uh, she had never missed a day of work. She was a pillar of strength, respected by people, but the situation in, uh, for a variety of reasons was just overwhelming. And we don't know exactly how it came to this, but it did have a tragic result. So this is what we need to be aware, no matter how well-trained, no matter how strong we think we are, we do have to mind ourselves and, and take care of ourselves. And this is what the whole purpose of trying to focus on resilience is. So what does resilience mean? Well, the dictionary says it's tough, strong, durable, sturdy. Uh, resilience is the ability to return to the original form after being bent or stretched. The ability to recover from illness, depression, adversity. It comes from the Latin word to spring back, which was coined in the 15th century. It's the opposite of weak, brittle, rigid. So. We're here today or for the next three days because we need to develop increased capacity to respond to the burden, the pressure that society is placing on us. Society and the demands of the current times are stretching us. It's the times we live in, but we're in public service and we need to be able to provide what's needed, the helping professions, medicine, law enforcement, this is what we do. And this is what the people we serve need us to do. But there's a silver lining. Learning about resilience, in addition to helping us fulfill our professional responsibilities, will also help us as people. It's like learning to get in shape through learning fitness. Uh, you may not know how to do it or even why you need to do it, but if you pay attention and practice, you'll learn something. And that'll be helpful, not just in your job, but in your life. So. I'm really thrilled that we could do this conference together. Uh, we are here for you in Columbia Psychiatry, the doctors and, uh, and staff at the hospital and the medical center. And uh, all Commissioner Shea or Jeff Thompson or Dr. Wachter have to do is call us and we'll be there. Our faculty have had a close relationship over the years and uh, we want to increase or sustain, increase that where they're possible and as needed. So I wish you uh, to have a great meeting and stay safe and Godspeed. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Lieberman. And it, it really means a lot, the, your partnership and everybody with Columbia, with us at the NYPD. And I think the, just to reiterate what you said there and part of the mindset behind this whole symposium, because it is geared towards police. But the line when we were putting this together with the committee and we looked at it, ultimately it's exactly what you said before this, before anybody is here to make themselves better in policing, no matter what, we're all human beings. And if this is gonna help police officers be better at their job first, it's gonna help them be better at a human being. And that's why we also, when we were promoting this event, it's not limited to police because if any of these practices and this information that Dr. Seligman will be sharing shortly helps police officers do their job, that's gonna help anybody that are first responders, frontline workers, like the thousands of people that work under you and anybody else that's part of this. And we, we truly believe that. And we, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us because there's still a lot of work to be done and we're all doing it, but we also gotta make sure if, no matter who you are in life, if you're out there helping other people, it's gotta start with yourself. And yeah, it's spot on with everything you said, doctor. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. You're welcome, amen. This is a moment at which our police, our other first responders especially need resilience and especially need well-being. So what I'm gonna do in the next half hour is to give you uh, my best overview of what the science tells us about how to have more resilience and how to have more well-being. Uh, here's the outline of what I'm gonna say. Uh, Dr. Seligman, I just want to jump in one more time. Do you want to just try sharing your screen one more time? I think it was a tech issue on our side. Can you just try it one more time, please? Uh, okay. 
Jeff, am I sharing the screen correctly now or not? No, try click, click that green button, share screen. It should be um, available now. Okay, let, let me try it. Does that work now, Jeff? No, I'd say not. A, uh, let's see. Yep, there you go. Okay. You're good. Okay, so here, here's the outline of what I'm going to do in the next uh, 30 minutes, if I can get the outline working. I'm going to talk about learned helplessness, where I started in resilience. I'm going to talk about uh, trying to get my clicker working here. There we go. I'm going to uh, talk about who does not become helpless and what we know about resilience. I'm going to ask the question, can resilience be taught? Then I'm going to talk about uh, very extensive work with the entire United States Army in which the aim was to teach resilience to a million soldiers. It's called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. I'm going to tell you about the results of Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we know about PTSD from, com from Comprehensive Soldier Fitness. Uh, and who's most vulnerable and who's not. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about brand new data that none of you would know about, predicting of heroism and predicting exemplary performance uh, for 900,000 soldiers in the Army over five years. And finally, I'm going to make my recommendations uh, as best I can about what I think the New York City police should do and police generally. So that's it. Um, so, uh, more than 50 years ago, I was part of a group that found that when animals and people uh, experience bad events that they could not control, that a phenomenon called helplessness developed. And helplessness was characterized first by passivity. Uh, once people were helpless, once animals were helpless, even though things were escapable and they could do something about it, they didn't even try. Uh, secondly, uh, their cognitive abilities went down. They had trouble learning that they could master uh, events. Uh, and in addition, uh, they were sad and anxious. Uh, they lost appetite. Um, they uh, lost aggression. Um, they were defeated more in uh, competition. There was sleep disruption. Um, there was increased physical illness, and I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but we now know quite a lot about the brain loci where helplessness occurs. It's basically in the dorsal raphane nucleus, which is a necessary and sufficient condition of helplessness, and we now know how to block helplessness. There are circuits in uh, the medium prefrontal cortex that block helplessness. But what you will have noticed when I went through the symptoms is that depression and post-traumatic stress disorder look a lot like learned helplessness. And that's my uh, uh, way in to talk about uh, resilience. And the reason for that is after about 10 years of working on helplessness in animals and people, um, we consistently found that only about two thirds of people in the laboratory and in real life uh, became helpless once they encountered bad events. One third, I could not make helpless. So I began to worry now 40 years ago about what was it about some people who made them resilient and resistant to helplessness. And what we found, what it, it was the optimism that produced it. And let me tell you what I mean by optimism. Um, optimistic people, in my use of the term, are people who, when bad events occur, uh, they fail an examination, they think it's temporary rather than permanent. So rather than saying I'm stupid, which is permanent, they say I had a hangover, which is temporary. Uh, the second thing an optimist, as opposed to a pessimist, chronically thinks is that when bad events occur, it's not going to ruin my whole life. It's just this one situation. So again, if you're rejected by someone you love, uh, you might think I'm unlovable. 
Well, that's pervasive. On the other hand, you might think uh, he's just a mean bastard, and uh, that's specific. Uh, so indeed, uh, optimistic people find the local specific causes, pessimistic people find the pervasive causes. Um, and finally, optimistic people uh, believe when bad events occur, they can do something about it. Pessimistic people chronically believe that bad events are unchangeable. So the people who resisted helplessness in the laboratory generally were the people who believed it's going away quickly, it's just this one situation, and I can do something about it. Um, so we then went on for more than a decade to ask, well, what are the consequences of being an optimist in real life? And the first thing we found is that um, optimistic people uh, became depressed at only half the rate of pessimistic people when bad events occurred. <clears throat> the second thing we found was that optimistic people achieved more in the workplace. Uh, they got more awards, they sold more policies, they came back from defeat, they had uh, higher earned run averages uh, uh, in close games and the like. Uh, and uh, this is true not only in work, but in school as well. So we found that optimistic people, talent being equal, went on to have higher grade point averages in high school and in university. Uh, <coughs> and we found this in Major League Baseball, in the NBA, and in uh, Olympic level swimming. Basically, the lesson from sports was that Optimistic people, after bad events, come back. They're resilient. A field grew up in which we found they had better physical health. On average, optimistic people live um, about uh, seven to nine years longer than pessimistic people, co-varying out all the general risk factors. So this is, uh, being an optimist is uh, uh, roughly quantitatively uh, like uh, uh, not smoking two and a half packs of cigarettes a day for cardiovascular disease. We found that optimistic people had better interpersonal relationships. People like optimistic people more than pessimistic people. So those are the consequences. And then uh, we asked the question, well, could, could you take pessimistic people and make them optimistic? This is really the question, is uh, resilience teachable, trainable. So starting more than 30 years ago, uh, we began to take the skills that optimistic people had and teach them to pessimists and asking if pessimists uh, became more optimistic and if they went on to do better in the world. And uh, last time I looked, there were 21 revocations of this around the world. That was uh, more than five years ago, so it's probably double that by now. Uh, we found uh, that uh, this uh, replicated uh, repeatedly. Uh, uh, we do controlled experiments there. In, in the optimism and resilience literature, there's almost always an equal group uh, that gets a, a placebo or nothing. Importantly, this is done with diverse samples. It's been done uh, in Beijing, it's been done with poor people, with rich people. It's been done in quite a number of professions. In the Penn Resilience Program, uh, we don't train people, we train the trainers. So this is a train the trainer model. Uh, and uh, so that was the background 20 years ago when I found myself uh, called to the Pentagon by uh, the chief of staff of the army. Uh, George Casey. And I found myself at a meeting of uh, the general staff, and uh, uh, General Casey said, suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic, drug addiction, divorce. Uh, what does positive psychology say about that, Dr. Seligman? And I said, um, well, sir, uh, you've just uh, described uh, the way in which awful events like combat can ruin a person's life. But I think it's important to remember that the reaction of soldiers, the reaction of police, 
the reaction of all individuals uh, across populations is Gaussian, uh, bell-shaped. And you've described the left-hand side of the curve, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide, panic, drug addiction, and the like. But the important thing to know is the middle of the curve is uh, human resilience. And human resilience means that you go through a bad time in combat. It's very difficult. Uh, uh, but three months later, you're back to where you were, both physically and psychologically. And then on the right-hand side of the curve, uh, often ignored is post-traumatic growth. These are people operationally who often go through a very hard time in combat. They often show post-traumatic stress disorder, but 12 months later, they're stronger physically and psychologically than they were uh, to begin with. Uh, and so my recommendation, General Casey, uh, is to move the entire curve to the right toward post-traumatic growth. <clears throat> Whereupon General Casey did a couple of things that I will remember for the rest of my life. First, he said, uh, I'm gonna create a United States Army that is just as psychologically strong as physically strong. And that's gonna be my legacy to the nation. Uh, and to do this, uh, we're going to measure and teach uh, optimism and positive psychology and resilience to the 1.1 million soldiers in the army. And uh, I'm gonna devote, uh, he allocated $140 million to do this. And so uh, what happened uh, soon after that with uh, General Ron de Cornum uh, we developed a resilience training for the Army. And then for the next uh, six years, uh, every month, 180 drill sergeants would come to the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, this was a result of General Casey saying, we see, Dr. Seligman, that you use a train-the-trainer model. And you, have te you teach the teachers the skills of resilience and optimism and positive psychology. And then the teachers teach the students and you measure it in the students. Well, we have 40,000 teachers in the army. And I said, really? He said, yeah, the drill sergeants. So your job will be to train the 40,000 drill sergeants in the army and they will train uh, the 1.1 million soldiers. And so as a result, uh, every month for the next several years, 180 drill sergeants came to the University of Pennsylvania for 10 days, and my faculty taught them first the, the, uh, how to use the skills of resilience, optimism, positive psychology in their own life, and then how to teach it to soldiers. Uh, and uh, that's the, I'll, I'll show you some data from that. That's the comprehensive soldier and family fitness uh, uh, program. Uh, it's now a regulation in the United States Army, and it's taught in all the forts. Uh, every soldier now goes through comprehensive soldier and family fitness. And uh, we also do this with the police, uh, with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and with the International Association of Chiefs of Police. <coughs> yeah. So let me tell you a bit about what we do uh, in comprehensive soldier fitness. Uh, so uh, I'm, I only have time to talk about two of the 10 skills that we teach. But the first one, very relevant to COVID, of course, is called put it in perspective. And so uh, the background here is that human beings are bad weather animals. And when something bad occurs, we go to the most catastrophic interpretation of it. And some of us stick with that catastrophic interpretation. And these are the people, the pessimists who go under. So the question is changing pessimists from catastrophic to non-catastrophic. So the uh, technique here basically is you have people imagine uh, a bad scenario. So in the one I'm about to do, uh, you're a sergeant and you take your men out on an all night uh, 
uh, uh, patrol and you come back after midnight and one of the men is missing. So what do you say to yourself? So we ask people, well, what's the, what's the worst case? What's the most catastrophic uh, situation? And they say, uh, uh, I bet he's lost. Uh, 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 he might have gotten heat stroke. We're never going to find him. He's dead. And uh, I'm going to have to wake up uh, uh, the captain. And I am really in trouble. And you say, okay. Now, what's the best case? Well, the best case is uh, he's taking a nap somewhere. She's getting caught up on sleep. Uh, and uh, 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 when he wakes up and comes in, he's going to be uh, embarrassed to see the whole platoon looking at him. And I'm going to write him about this for a good long time. And now, what's the most likely case? Well, he got lost. His cell phone battery uh, went down. Uh, uh, the other sergeants are going to uh, uh, ride me about this. Uh, and we're going to have to go out and look for him. And he's probably walking the road waiting for a vehicle to give him a lift. So we find that when we do this uh, exercise, it moves people's judgment to be more rational and less catastrophic. Uh, here's a second technique, uh, very important. Uh, now, in, in psychiatry and clinical psychology, we're very good at uh, responding uh, to misery. But uh, uh, how do we respond when uh, a friend or our spouses tell us about a victory, and it turns out uh, there's a two by two table you're looking here, you're looking at here, uh, and so uh, let's say uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Jackson says to uh, another Staff Sergeant, "My wife called and told me she just got a great job on the post." What do you say when someone tells you something like that? Well, uh, you might say. Uh, active destructive well you know who's going to be looking after your son you're never going to find a good babysitter that ruins relationships uh you might do and <coughs> this is what i did until i read this literature uh passive constructive oh well that's very nice sergeant that has no effect uh you might do passive destructive which is i got a funny email from my son, uh, listen to this. Well, it turns out the only thing that works and it builds relationships, uh, when you do it in marriage counseling, it decreases divorce, it increases sexuality, it increases commitment and loyalty, is active constructive. And an active constructive, it takes time. You have to say more than just that's nice. You have to go into it at length. Say, that's really great. But what are the details of this new job for your wife? Uh, when does she, uh, when, when does it start? Now, exactly what did your wife say uh, when she told you about this great job? And what are the strengths your wife has that'll make you good at that? Now, this seems, this is important, not just for how police and soldiers relate for each other, but how you relate to your spouse. Uh, I'm gonna show you statistics statistics in a moment, but I'll, I'll just tell you something emblematic of uh, how people change when they learn this technique. Uh, uh, I was teaching this uh, one day to uh, our drill sergeants, and I came in the next morning uh, for breakfast at seven in the morning, and one of the drill sergeants came up to me and said, uh, Dr. Seligman, I have to tell you what happened last night. Uh, my son, uh, who's 11 years old, uh, called me on the phone. We had our nine o'clock conversation and he had hit a home run in Little League and he told me about it. And uh, I used your technique. And after about three minutes, my son said, is this really you, dad? Well, that's what people learn. Uh, loyalty, love, uh, closeness. Particularly important for police and soldiers whose natural inclination, they're selected for this, is uh, active destructive. Very important to become active constructive. Well, 
Uh, let me give you some data here. Uh, so what we wanted to do with the 1.1 million soldiers was a controlled experiment in which many of the soldiers wouldn't get resilience training. But it turned out this became so popular so quickly that we lost our control group after the first few months. Uh, so there is no control group. It's a regulation in the Army, and everyone learns uh, uh, resilience training. But uh, when we still had a control group, uh, this is what we found uh, 90 days fo following deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan. This is about with about 7,000 soldiers. We found that the soldiers that had had uh, master resilience training had a significantly lower rate of panic, post-traumatic stress disorder, and depression, and they had a much lower rate, half the rate, of substance abuse. So that was uh, the first finding we had, but I repeat, we no longer have a control group here. Uh, we then looked at indiscipline over the same period, and we did this actually with the sergeants, and again we found that uh, those uh, people who had gone through MRT training had about uh, only 25% of the rate of indiscipline. Okay, so uh, basically the findings from uh, uh, pen resilience training were uh, uh, lower substance abuse and better mental health after deployment uh, and uh, better discipline. Two new findings, and then I'll stop, and we'll do uh, Q and A here. So uh, General Cornum and I, in addition to doing resilience training, were fortunate enough with the Robert J Johnson Foundation to uh, become the custodians of the entire United States military uh, uh, database. Uh, and since every soldier in the army. Uh, takes uh, a uh, measurement, 120 item questionnaire, which measures uh, uh, not only the usual bad things, but it measures strength, it measures catastrophic thinking, it measures happiness, it measures negative emotion. And they take this once a year. And because we have the entire Army database, we're able to look over time uh, to try to predict what happens to people when they go into combat. And uh, here's an a important set of findings. We ask the question, is being a catastrophizer, that is being a pessimist, does this, at, uh, when you sign up for the Army, when you first enter, does this uh, And to do this, we had 80,000 soldiers, all of whom were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan over, uh, I believe, a three-year period. Uh, and uh, at the outset, they're all free from any pre-existing psychological disorder. Uh, we then asked, could we predict PTSD? And what we found uh, in the course of deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan, about uh, uh, 3,700 of them were diagnosed with PTSD. So we asked the question, that was about, about 5%. <clears throat> we asked the question, could we predict uh, who's going to come down with PTSD? And uh, this graph shows you the prediction. Uh, there are two uh, major risk factors for PTSD. The first is the severity of combat. Uh, and as you can see from the three different lines, the more severe the combat, the more likely you are to come down with PTSD. So uh, severe combat, uh, is not surprisingly, is a major risk factor for PTSD. But most importantly, being a catastrophizer is also a major risk factor. So you can see that catastrophizers who go into severe combat uh, are uh, about twice as likely to come down with PTSD. Uh, so the combination of going into a very risky situation and being a catastrophizer is a major risk factor for PTSD uh, diagnosis after. And the lesson here 
for the police and for the army is that if you have to go into a very difficult situation, you want to send the non-catastrophizers. You want to send the optimists and not the pessimists. One more finding, and then I'll give you my recommendation. Um, we just found uh, uh, surprisingly large data on heroism and exemplary performance in the army. Uh, our sample here was uh, 900,000 soldiers in the army. Remember, they all take the uh, questionnaire uh, when they enter the army. And then over the next five years, uh, there are 150 different jobs in the army, and 12.6% uh, of them get awards. Uh, some of the awards are for heroism. This was done during Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but most of the awards are for exemplary job performance. And uh, what we looked at was uh, three major predictors of who's going to get a heroism award or an exemplary performance award over the next five years. The first major predictor was people who enter the army with high positive emotion. So high positive emotion, being a happy person, cheerful, merry, optimistic, uh, is a predictor of awards. Secondly, being a low negative affect person is a predictor of uh, 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 getting an awards. And being highly optimistic is a predictor. Now, the magnitude of this effect knocks our socks off. This is a 400% effect. People who start off high in positive emotion, low in negative emotion, and high in optimism uh, are 400% more likely to get a heroism award or an exemplary performance award. Finally, my recommendation. <coughs> I want to say, by the way, that my loyalties here are to the police and not to the University of Pennsylvania. So I'm going to sit back and tell you objectively what I think police forces should be doing right now. Uh, first, when we hire police and we have an entire police force, we should measure catastrophization. And it's measurable. Uh, uh, there are good questionnaires for it. And the reason for this is the high catastrophizers who are more likely to come down with depression, panic, and worst of all, PTSD. My second recommendation, we should measure at the outset positive affect, negative affect, and optimism. Uh, again, there are good questionnaires for this that are reliable. And the reason for that is uh, people who are high in positive emotion to begin with, low in negative emotion, and high in optimism are much more likely to do a good job, to be heroes and to receive uh, exemplary performance awards. And finally, I think the New York City police and police everywhere should do due diligence on what the best resilience programs are. There are plenty of them out there. University of Pennsylvania is just one of them. And I think it's very important to look across the range of resilience programs and ask, what is the most suitable uh, for our heroic police at this crucial time? So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, uh, Dr. Seligman. I appreciate all of that. I see we have a bunch of questions and just touching on very briefly that last statement that you made there. There are plenty of resilience programs out there. We have some people sharing them later today and over the course of the days. And the recommendation that I always say, and I don't know if you wanna just share a couple words on it. I just say, find, and whether for the individual or the agency, I think we're past the point of should we do this? It's yes, you should be doing it. And just make sure whichever one you decide on or select that it's backed by research and science. Um, I don't, do you have any thoughts to add to that at all? Um, well, there are plenty of programs out there. Uh, the audience is going to hear about them over the next three days. Uh, 
the elements, and I think you want to do due diligence, the elements that are important are uh, uh, how much scientific data there is behind them. Is it a train-the-trainer program? And is it adoptable to modern policing? And uh, you might want to just adopt one off the shelf, or you might want to, the Marines, for example, uh, created their own uh, Marine comprehensive fitness program. The Air Force created their own comprehensive airmen fitness and the like. So right. the New York City police might want to create their own, or they might want to take one off the shelf, or they might want to combine them. Great. Thank you. So um, I see we have a bunch of questions. I want to try and get to as many as we can. And I saw the one question was, uh, you had mentioned a few times about the negative impact of catastrophic thinking and how that um, can lead somebody down potentially a downward spiral. Do you have any examples or specific practices somebody that somebody can do to catch themselves in that moment and how to prevent them further catastrophize in it and where it just keeps piling on? Well, uh, uh, you know, I, I've written a couple of whole books about this, but let me just tell you a couple of them. The, the key to non-catastrophic thinking and changing uh, pessimism into optimism is to first uh, know what you're thinking. So you have to be recognized what you're thinking. So, um, uh, uh, let me tell you about me and COVID. You know, I'm 78 years old. Uh, I hear about COVID six months ago, and my first reaction is catastrophic. Uh, I'm going to get it. I'm going to die. It's going to ruin my life. My family's going to be bereft. So because I work on this, I knew that was my most catastrophic thought. And then I went through, put it in perspective. I said, okay, the most catastrophic thought is I'm doomed. Uh, Okay, what's the best possible outcome? Well, the best possible outcome is COVID's going away quickly. I'm not going to get it. I'll protect myself. And, and even if I get it, I, you know, I'm in great physical shape. Uh, uh, nothing bad will happen to me. And then I said, well, what's the most realistic outcome? The most realistic outcome is uh, COVID really might be here for quite a long time. There's a pretty good chance... Uh, that I will be exposed, I may well get it, uh, and I may be uh, sick for a couple of weeks, uh, but I am in good physical shape, uh, my immune system is good, and I'm taking good precautions, so this is a bad event, but it's not a catastrophic one. So recognizing the most catastrophic things you say to yourself and rationally arguing against them, not unrealistically arguing against them, but rationally arguing against them. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Seligman. And I think it's exactly, and I see people typing a lot of stuff in the chat box, it's stopping to acknowledge it. And then trying to, it's a, taking that moment in the poison, I think from your books and your other teachings and the others as well, it's doing the practice. It's not just knowing the practice of how to do it. It's then just actually following through. Uh, and I hope that answers the, the question that the person had. Let's move on to another one. Uh, all right. So this one I thought was interesting. When you looked at your data, did you find that women generally had an optimistic approach to dealing with stressful situations compared to men? So was there a difference between women and men generally? Oh, we, we very carefully look at racial differences, sex differences, uh, <clears throat> education differences and the like. Uh, and interestingly, there really are not gender differences of note. Uh, Officers are a little better at this kind of stuff than enlisted people. There are no black-white differences. There are no Hispanic-white-black differences. So in general, uh, uh, optimism and, uh, is pretty democratic across women and men, across education, and across ethnicity. Important non-cognitive factor. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just jumping ahead, reading some other questions. So here, here's oh, yes. one, one more thing about that. Uh, if you break down women versus men, it turns out women are more optimistic than men about relationships, but men are more optimistic than women about work. Okay. So the next question we have is um, somebody mentioned around the same time of your learned helplessness work, Dr. Richter's experiment 
with rats indicated that hope mitigates learned helplessness. Is hope the same as optimism to you or whether hope and optimism? Uh, yes. And in fact, my, uh, my latest book is called The Hope Circuit and it's entirely about hope. So it turns out the key to this is the learning of hope. And in fact, we know something now about the brain circuit that runs, uh, and we only know this for rats. Uh, we don't know it for humans yet because these are very small circuits that are not accessible. But there's a brain circuit that runs from the ventral medial prefrontal cortex down into the dorsal rafe nucleus. That seems to be the hope circuit. When it is ignited, it turns on hope and it turns off the dorsal rafe nucleus, which seems to be in rats the structure that causes learned helplessness. So the key to this is hope. So and, uh, it, I want to take this opportunity to recommend the hope circuit to you. It's the best book I ever wrote. And um, just so everybody knows, in, in, in all genuine in reality, for people that are interested in this and any of the other speakers, that's why we purposely have underneath their bio, under the um, agenda tab to dig deeper. And we hope you will. Uh, let's see. The next question here is, would you say that a feeling of connecting this to others, as in your example in your two by two grid, showing interest, being happy for someone else's good news, helps increase resilience? So the connected, the connection between connectedness to others and resilience. Uh, <clears throat> uh, for me, uh, the notion of well-being involves five elements. PERMA is yeah. the acronym. P is positive emotion. E is engagement. R is good relationships, M is meaning and purpose, and A is achievement. So resilience for me is the recovery of PERMA. Mm -hmm. And what the uh, active constructive responding does is it produces better relationships. So in the well-defined sense of resilience, in which you break it down to its elements, uh, uh, active constructive responding increases relationships and therefore increases resilience. Great, and I can tell you, and everyone else, uh, Dr. Peggy Kern from University of Melbourne will be talking more about PERMA Thursday oh, evening in our positive good. psychology session. Yeah. Uh, uh, Peggy uh, Kern at Melbourne has the best measure of PERMA, and it's the kind of thing that I think police want to adopt. Absolutely. And I, believe, I believe it's free. Yeah, and we have, I believe, the link for the PERMA, um, the way she evaluates it. I'm a big proponent as well, and I use it for some of my research. It's, oh, it's yeah. fantastic. And very importantly about resilience programs, a lot of the stuff is free, and a lot of the stuff is very inexpensive. Great. Uh, I just realized we have many, many more questions than I thought we did. So I'm just grabbing people. Please don't get mad. I'm just grabbing them now randomly. Uh, let's see. Well, maybe here's one, just if you can, oh, all right, actually. Um, the catastrophic thinking, there's a lot of comments and questions on that. Um, I think, Pia, that really touched with a lot of people. This one, is it similar to cynicism? Uh, it's uh, related to cynicism. I, I've never measured cynicism, uh, but it is the immediate leap to... Uh, the worst possible interpretation. Cynicism, in my sense of it, is uh, the way you present yourself. And it may not necessarily be your deepest belief. Here we go to the deep belief that when bad things occur, the world is coming to an end. And that's what you want to get rid of. Okay, great. I think we have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, this one's a bit different from some of the others. So how you mentioned earlier, the train the trainer model that you've been using, um, does your study look at the impact of a leader who's not optimistic over the employee who is, which I think, in, especially in policing and beyond policing too, for everybody else, um, the impact of the leader and whether or not their optimism level is? Yeah, the leader is crucial here. So uh, when we were doing the National Basketball Association, uh, many years ago, we were able, we we began by taking all the optimism and pessimism from sports page quotes of all the players, and it turned out optimistic teams did better than pessimistic teams, co-varying out skill and the like. But then we found if we just took the coach, 
that that predicted it just as well. So the leader is crucial. Yeah, and one thing um, that popped into my mind, somebody else affiliated at the UPenn program, uh, Karen Rivich, which unfortunately we couldn't work with her schedule to get her to present at this symposium, but her book on um, resilience, and I know the term that she uses a lot is realistic optimism too. And yeah. I know we don't have time to go into it in this segment, but the idea of realistic optimism isn't sticking your head in the sand or saying everything's going to be fine and then not doing anything about it. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, but I will also just throw to you at the same time, maybe any closing comments that you'd like to share with everybody. Yes, I, I do have a closing comment, but uh, let me emphasize that realistic optimism is crucial here. You can't argue against catastrophic thinking with unrealistic uh, evidence. Uh, you have to believe the evidence. So you need realistic evidence. Uh, and you can find the realistic evidence for the most part. So I did have a closing comment, Jeff, if I may make it. Yeah, absolutely, please. Uh, and it, it actually comes from uh, 650 years ago, uh, from the Black Plague. Uh, and uh, there was a monk uh, named Julian of Norwich. Turns out it was a female monk, uh, and she had... She had to go by the name Julian. She was really Juliana. And, and here's what she said about the Black Plague, uh, right in the midst of the worst of times. She said, he said not, thou shalt not be travailed. He said not, thou shalt not be diseased. He said, Thou shalt not be overcome, and all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So thank you, John. Dr. Seligman, on behalf of the hundreds that are in this room at the moment and the thousands that will be here over the next three days, it's uh, honestly, it's been an honor to have you here. We appreciate you taking the time.